Okay, anyway, back to where we were. Um, so this program right here, GCC, is a compiler. It takes the source code of this C program and it turns it into an executable. Uh, this executable file on Linux machines anyway is called an ELF, which stands for Executable and Linker Format, I think. Damn it, is that what it's called? Uh, well, the name isn't terribly important, but just to know that ELF files are the executable file format that run on Linux systems. Um, another example of an executable file format would be portable executable that runs on Windows systems. Uh, in any case, uh, this main function that we're worried about, called main, actually makes use of this thing right here called printf, which is a shared library function, which we're really not going to get into today. We're going to mostly just look at this assembly and reversing of non system library functions that are huge and complicated and crazy. Okay, so what we have here is some example programs that ship with many, many Linux distributions that you can use to kind of get a, a little bit better look at the uh, ELF file itself and see some information about it. So the first program that's really important is this top one called File. If you run File on that Hello program that we just compiled, uh, File will tell you this is an ELF. It's a 64-bit binary that you can run. Um, so that's very useful to know. Uh, the strings program, likewise, can actually print all ASCII character sequences located in this program. That is also a very good program to know, because sometimes when you're doing a CTF challenge, uh, the flag will just be sitting in the binary in plain text, and strings will show that to you. Uh, otherwise, this XXD program will print a hex dump of the file, and you can use that to see some cool things like for instance, if I just ran xxd on uh, user bin ls, you'll see right at the beginning there's an elf, uh, plain text. And this is part of the elf header that exists in elf files whenever they're produced by a compiler. Um, so xxd is literally showing me the bytes that make up this program. And it's not a one-to-one -one correlation with the instructions that get executed on your processor, uh, but the machine code that does get executed in your processor is actually located in this file somewhere, uh, which is really neat. So um, back to this. Um, so this word right here called uh, disassembly is an important word. Uh, essentially, whenever the instructions that uh, get compiled out of your from your from your source code are in this file. Uh, the compilation process is something called lossy, which means that there's actually information lost when you compile source code into a binary executable. However, there is actually a pretty much a directly one-to-one -one correlation between machine code, which is which are the actual instructions that execute on your processor, and something called assembly. Uh, assembly is uh, it, it's basically a direct representation of the machine code. Um, how many of you have been exposed to assembly before or know what assembly looks like and have worked with it? Oh, sweet. Okay, it's great. Um, how many of you ever or know how a function, uh, like a, let's see, a function prolog and epilog work? Function prolog, epilog. Sweet. Okay, cool. So that's, that's good stuff. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let's see. Uh, the last important thing, um, well, no, I'll cover that in a second. Uh, all right. So, so far, we've only been talking about the file uh, of a binary, which is what gets produced when a compiler compiles source code into a, an executable file. But whenever you go to actually execute that file and make a process out of it, something cool and special happens with the file. And it's kind of up to the operating system, kind of up to some shared libraries that uh, determine how that file gets loaded into memory. Anytime you run a program, the entire thing gets loaded into memory, and then the instructions get read into the CPU for the process to actually execute. Okay. Um, 
So this will probably be review for a lot of you, but I put it in here just in case because it's pretty important. Uh, memory is addressed by byte. So if you've got a 32-bit number, uh, well, I kind of skipped a bit here. A byte can take on values 0 through 255, uh, which means there are 256 discrete values. In hexadecimal, a byte goes from OX00 to OXFF. In binary, that's eight zeros to eight ones. On 32-bit systems, that means that you can address four, and I just threw this in here because I'm weird, but this, this word, give a byte, is the technical term for it, which it's kind of weird. No one ever says it. Uh, but it's pretty close to four gigabytes, which is the SI notation for something, for numbers. And uh, in hexadecimal, this range of addressable bytes on a 32-bit system is a four-byte number, which goes from OX, all zeros, to OX, FFFF, FFFF. And that is approximately this many bytes, or uh, yeah, this many addressable bytes. So let's see. Uh, this is important to know because on a 64-bit system, we actually have double the number of bits of addressable space, but that actually increases the amount of addressable memory to this crazy, crazy number that's way more than four gigabytes. It's 16 exabytes, which is approximately 16 exabytes. Um, on a 64-bit 64 64 system, you have eight bytes of addressable address space that things can be located in in memory. Uh, in practice, no one has 16 exabytes of memory. In fact, I don't think there's that much memory on the entire planet Earth. Um, but nevertheless, whenever you run a program, every process is actually granted access to the full address space. And uh, if you, well, I guess let me just ask, has anyone here seen or understand how virtual memory gets mapped to physical memory? I think that's covered in operating systems, or maybe before. Yeah. Compor actually talked about virtual memory. Okay, that was a long time ago for me. Uh, but essentially, what ends up happening is you've got a virtual memory address space allocated to every single process. That is the full address space. Uh, so even if you're on a 32-bit system with only one gig of RAM, every process gets access to four gigs of address space per process. And uh, the operating system has to do some magic to, uh, to essentially keep track of all the memory that's used. And any process that actually even approaches using uh, more than the physical amount of RAM on the system has to get its stuff paged out to disk. Uh, but that's like a whole different discussion. Um, basically, uh, what's important about uh, What's important to know about processes whenever they get created in memory is that you can have 10 different processes, all with their main function located at the same address, but they're completely separated by the operating system because it's a virtual memory per process. So if you've got process one that's got main starting at address XYZ, and you've got another program that's got main starting at the same address, there's no collision there because they're in separate virtual address spaces. All right? So that's the main takeaway from this slide. This picture at the right, now at the left, is also very important. Um, when, a pro when a file, an executable, gets l loaded by the operating system or the dynamic linker, dynamic loader, something, something, uh, all the data in that ELF file gets mapped to memory. And if you'll notice these addresses that are listed here on the left, we've got zero, which is the start, and at the top. So there's some contention about this, but when you think about memory address, when you think about memory space, um, I like to think about it like a book where the zeroth character is at the top left and the nth character is down at the bottom right. So you've got high memory down near the bottom, and you got low memory near the top. It might seem backwards, but I think it's the best way and the only way. So anyway, that was a little bit of an aside. Uh, however, the main takeaway from 
this particular slide and the information on it is that when uh, when a binary gets loaded into memory, the different sections are mapped also to the virtual the virtual memory address space. And these sections right here on this picture called text, RO data, data, and the heap are all way near the very, very, very top of the memory address space. Uh, in fact, this number here, uh, OXD80000, is only about 17 megabytes into the address space. Uh, on the other hand, this piece of a process uh, in the virtual memory address space called the stack is allocated way down here near uh, this OX7F number, which there should actually be two more Fs here, which means the distance is even greater than what I have on the next slide. Um, but even with only uh, four bytes here, the distance between the heap and the stack is about two gigs, two gigabytes, and the dif distance between the start of the file and the heap is only about 17 megabytes. So it's like orders of magnitude distance between, uh, between these addresses, okay? Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions so far? Am I going too fast or anything like that? Okay, cool. So the only other important thing about this particular slide, let me just make sure, the parts of your program, so uh, let me, ah, uh, oh shoot. So the parts of your program that are important that you keep in mind when you're writing it, like variables and code, they all are all, they're all mapped into memory address space from the ELF file itself uh, in this order, okay? After the header is mapped into memory, the text section is actually the section of memory which contains all the executable code that gets executed and it's all way near the top of the memory address space. Um, data and RO data are where your uh, initialized global variables are, are stored, okay? And RO data stands for read-only data, so this is when you declare final or const uh, variables, uh, and data is readable and writable, so if you have like a variable before main that's defined and you want to be able to store data in it and read from it, it's put up here in the data section. All other data, such as local function data, so if you have a, ver if you have a function named main, and main has a variable called username, that's actually going to go on the stack uh, in main's stack frame, okay? So, anyone have any questions about what I just said? Sweet. Okay. Um, this is what I just said. So, so just keep in mind that the distance between this very start of the file and the squiggle line here, the squiggle line represents a huge chasm, a gulf between address spaces. So remembering that stuff near really, really high memory address space is part of the stack and part of your system's environment, which is copied into every executable, uh, is important to know, okay? Um, all right, so that's enough about memory. Anyone have any questions about memory? Okay. Uh, so CPU registers are actually the most local memory to the CPU that you can possibly get. It's the, it's the working, it's even closer than the working memory of the CPU. It's, how all the calculations are performed, okay? Uh, to actually be able to look at assembly and know what's happening, you need to know what the different registers are used for. I have them all on this slide for you. Uh, the most important one to talk about is this RIP, which is the instruction pointer. And the instruction pointer, uh, if you've never heard of it, it's literally like a pointing finger that the, that the processor points at a line of code and says, this is what I'm going to execute next, okay? Every time it executes an instruction, the RIP, the, the instruction pointer, moves to the next instruction. Um, anytime a function is called, the instruction pointer is pointed to that function's assembly, and it, it keeps executing. Uh, it keeps executing until that function's assembly says, return back to where you were, and then RIP gets updated back to where it was before executing that function. Um, let's see. The other two very important variables, <laughs> I mean registers, are the stack registers. 
Uh, the stack pointer points to the top of the stack. Oh, I should probably go back to this picture. So these little arrows that are here in this stack uh, graphic that Grant so awesomely drew for me, by the way, thank you. Uh, the stack grows toward lower memory, uh, which means the top of the stack is actually at a lower memory address than the bottom of the stack. So the base pointer points at the bottom of the stack, and the bottom of the stack is at a higher memory address than the stack pointer, which points at the top of the top of the stack. That might seem very a little confusing, but once you kind of get in your head that that's just the way it is, it's better. Um, so that's what these two right here do. Uh, or I'm sorry, that's just what they are. What they do is actually, uh, what they actually do is keep track of the local stack frame of the currently executing function. Okay, so whenever main goes and calls another function like check authentication, a new stack frame has to get created so that all the variables and data that check authentication needs to work with can be kept separate from all of main's local stack variables. Make sense so far? Anyone have any questions about that? Yes? Is this uh, stuff on this page Linux or Windows or both? This is Linux. As, I mean, only Linux, as far as I know. Um, I'm not 100% sure how this applies to Windows. It's been a long time since I've used Windows. There would be things that do the same stuff, but not necessarily the exact same choices. Which I think so. I think that this right down here, the bottom right, syscall, is a convention that's up to the operating system or architecture. Uh, for Linux, so that's a good point. Uh, I should have mentioned this is all Linux specific as far as I know. There are probably, or maybe a lot of it, will carry over and be applicable to Windows as well. Uh, but I didn't check that or include that in this presentation. That being said, um, so far we've talked about RIP, which is the what executes next. The stack pointer and the base pointer keep track of, of the stack frame of the currently executing function. Uh, the other registers, RAX, RBX, RCX, and RDX, are general purpose. Uh, but RAX is kind of special in the sense that it's usually reserved for the return value of a function. So anytime a function returns back to the previous stack frame, RAX will hold the return value of that function. Um, otherwise, RSI and RDI are generally reserved for the first and second arguments of a function call. So anytime you've got a function that calls that needs arguments, they'll be passed through RDI and RSI. Uh, in that order, actually. So this is this is the order for system call arguments, and the next slide actually. Oh shoot. Okay. Well, I'll come to regular function calls because this is repeated. Uh, the only other thing that's really important to know is that registers can actually be addressed not by the entire thing, the entire 64 bits. You can actually address different parts of a register, and so in the in assembly, the register name will actually appear different to signify what part of it you are addressing. So as you can see from this little chart, the, the entire thing is called RAX, if we're looking at RAX for instance. The lowest uh, four bytes are going to be EAX. The lowest two bytes are AX. Uh, the highest byte of the lowest two bytes is AH, and the lowest byte of them all is AL. Um, and you'll see this naming convention with the X's on the end, X, H, L, and the R and the E apply to all of your general purpose registers, mostly the general purpose registers. Okay. Um, okay. Wow. Well, that was neat. Did anyone, uh, anyone have any questions about that? No? Okay. Cool. I hopefully, hopefully it's because it's clear and not because it's just crazy sounding. <laughs> okay. So the next part. This is like the meat and potatoes assembly. Um, I'm going to talk about these things. All right, let's do it. So whenever you're looking at assembly, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, these little black boxes, the top one is assembly in Intel format, which is better. And the bottom one is AT&T syntax, which is worse, in my opinion. The the reason I think it's worse is because there's percentage signs and all these extra symbols and dollars and it just looks all jumbled and crazy. Yes? Uh, let me answer my question. Okay. Oh, why? 
Oh, and the other thing that's very, very different, that's like the most confusing thing that can possibly be different between two instruction syntaxes is right here. The source and the destination are swapped, okay? <laughs> so if you're using Intel, the destination is the left operand, I think that's the word, and the source is on the right. With at and this is swapped. So if I'm moving something from source to destination, the source appears on the right for Intel, and the destination appears on the left for Intel. And that's the best way, okay? It seems backwards, but it's the best way. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay, so anyway, uh, this might look all crazy, right? But uh, if you just focus on the top box, what we've got on the left are uh, addresses, memory addresses. And this is a hexadecimal number. So it's OX400546. And what's really interesting is that this output is actually from our little hello program. And this is actually the entry point. This is not the entry point. This is the first instruction of the main function. And the first instruction of the main function is push RBP, which is represented by the machine code or the op code 55, uh, which is OX55 uh, hexadecimal. What's uh, super cool is if I actually go to, so this memory address is 400, 546, and I type uh, obj dump, oh shoot, I'm not even in the right place. Uh, sit, f, nope, ring, uh, sit, r, e, and what am I looking for? If I type, you can scroll this up. Is that too hard to see? I can make it bigger. Type uh, obj dump dash m intel uh, dash d dash capital D. Hello. Yes. Nope. Ah, what? Was it capital M lowercase i? Oh, shoot. How could I do that? Golly. Okay, so these are backwards. Anyway, M Intel, right? So I look for main. Um, here we can see the exact output that I just had in the slide. Uh, interestingly, if I do a <laughs> xxd hello less, and I come to this memory address, which was 400, uh, what was it? 460? 450, 460, 450, 560, oh gosh. 400, oh no. 405. Seriously? Oh yeah. You're right. So, um, if we look right here, so, this thing I was telling you about virtual memory address spaces uh, is real, uh, you know, the like the struggle. And right here, you can see there's a 400 before this 546, but in the actual file itself, I dropped the 400 because the dynamic loader knows to stick this file in the OX 400.000 address space. Um, so when we actually look at this output, Main starts here at uh, number five four uh, byte number five four six the instruction fifty five followed by forty eight eighty nine e five so if I look here at five sixty we've got one byte two three four five six uh, just kidding it's one two three four five six five forty six is this, is this right fifty five forty eight eighty nine e five so, so yeah, the actual machine code is in the file. This is why objdump can actually show me the assembly of the main function because they're actually just sitting here in the file right here. So this is actually my main function, and it goes all the way to this 90. Uh, like this line of code, this, this stuff, this, these bytes that I just highlight with my mouse, this is printf hello world exit, which is crazy, okay? 
the rest of, and you can see the string right here anyway, hello world, just sitting down here waiting to be referenced. Um, other than that, all this other code is boilerplate crazy stuff that the operating system uses to actually make it all work. And it's a little bit more advanced than even I think I understand. Um, so that was a little bit of an aside. Uh, the important, other important thing about the information on this slide is that certain assembly instructions, certain machine code instructions have side effects which do more than one thing, okay? And the important ones I've just listed right here. There is a special CPU register reserved for flags. And whenever we go into Radar, you'll actually see the flags register, it's called R flags. And certain instructions like compare will set this one that I've listed right here called the zero flag, okay? So if I compare two numbers, the easiest way to do so is to subtract them. And subtracting one number from, in, from another will tell me if the, the two numbers, if one is greater, if one is less than, or if they're equal. If they are, in fact, equal, the zero flag will become set, okay? And what that allows to happen is for another instruction to make use of the zero flag uh, to say something like, do something if these two values are equal. And so when I perform subtraction and the zero flag is set, the next instruction that says do something if these two values are equal knows that the two values were in fact equal. Um, otherwise, uh, these instructions listed right here, push, pop, call, leave, and ret, actually do stuff to the stack in addition to whatever else they do. Uh, and if this is going way too fast, you'll see all this later, like in great detail, with even greater explanation I have typed up, okay? Uh, just suffice to know, uh, if I push a value to the stack, the stack pointer actually gets subtracted by eight before the data is put in onto the stack. With pop, the data is read from the stack, and then the stack pointer is incremented by eight bytes. Um, with call, uh, the, the address of the next instruction is pushed onto the stack, and then rip is changed to be the instruction of the function that's being called. Uh, and leave and ret, I'll explain later. Uh, let's see what else. There are a couple of instructions that modify rip the instruction pointer directly, and those are call and jump. So when I call a function, the instruction pointer is set to the starting address of the function being called, which so it just makes the instruction pointer jump to another location. And jump does the same thing. Uh, except you're not really you're not calling a function. It's just going to go to another part uh, of the current function, or maybe uh, maybe it will actually jump to a function. Um, in either case, both of those will actually modify the instruction pointer directly. Um, okay. So this is where the syscall and function call uh, calling convention I talked about earlier are again reproduced. The for syscalls. So a system call is who who knows what a system call is version just versus just a regular function call. One person. Oops, not two people. Okay, sweet. So any time that a program needs to do something that only the kernel can handle, you need to make it a system call. And system calls are handled by the kernel. And there's actually a table of system call numbers that you can look at that show all the different system calls. So for instance, if I want to print something to my terminal screen, print output like hello world, uh, a user land program can't actually modify hardware, which is what you're doing if you're printing something to the screen. And so the kernel actually has to be invoked to, to handle that kind of stuff. Because it's, you're actually, you're actually modifying Kind of, kind of modifying the hardware of the computer. So is C++'s C out like the equivalent of MIPS's syscall? Uh, I think that part, I think that eventually it does end up getting passed to the kernel, no matter what. And I think C out goes to puts eventually. And I think puts is the actual system call. Or maybe, actually no, write. Write would be the system call. So just write to right a to device. Console. Yeah, write to a console. Um, and in higher level languages, the system calls actually get wrapped heavily in all sorts of user land preparatory pre functions, 
to prepare it to become a system call. Um, so the C out and C in are just like overloaded wrappers, basically, for system calls. Um, so the same thing applies for C programs. Anyway, uh, uh, you'll know a system call when you see it. When um, let me just uh, see if I can do an example here. You're actually going to see. So this is actually radar, which you're actually uh, hopefully I, I hope I can get y'all to use later. But anytime that you see this right here, it says sim.imp. This is an imported function because in my source code, I only had the main function. And when I said printf, that's not a function I wrote. That's imported from the C standard library. And that's what this imp right here stands for, is this, this is an imported function. And anytime you see this call something imported, this is going to end up being a system call, more likely than not, or usually. And uh, so this, for instance, is a system call. Um, OK, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, let's get back to this. So the main difference between syscalls and function calls are how RAX is used and how arguments three through five, how arguments three through five are also passed. Otherwise, they're the same. So when I make a function call, if my hello world had int argc for counting the number of arguments past the main and then character pointer to an argv array. Uh, those two arguments would actually be passed into main via RDI and RSI as their arguments. Okay. Um, let's see. The other information on this slide, OX32, that's really important is the call instruction, function prologue, and the function epilogue. Uh, these are kind of what I would call bundled. Uh, bundled instructions. So when I call, when I actually execute call and then a function address, it ends up pushing the next instruction onto the stack and jumping to that address to start executing it. The function prolog. Okay, so this is not a this is not a bundled um, instruction, but any time a function is called, you'll end up seeing something looking like this as as the first three or four instructions of the called function. Uh, the function epilogue, uh, oh, and I should say, the purpose of these three instructions is actually to set up the, the, the function's local stack frame. And the function epilogue basically just reverses it. Uh, but you'll see that in more detail later. Um, OK. So <laughs> anyone have any questions about any of that? Yeah. Well, if any of that was not clear, this little animation should make it super clear. Uh, I've, I've kind of trimmed down the output of Redair so that you can just see the important parts. And uh, I've only got a handful of registers sitting right here up at the top. Uh, this little part of the window right here is my disassembly of the assembly instructions of the hello program that I wrote. And over here on the right is a little picture of the stack. Okay. So to kind of get an idea of how assembly instructions uh, get executed, I've color-coded the different parts of the stack and the corresponding registers that store the information about them. So I was talking earlier about the stack pointer always pointing to the top of the stack. Well, this is, so the value of the stack pointer register is this number. And you can see it ends in C0. And that's this memory address over here, which is really far down in memory address space, a really high number. This is really, it's, it's hard to talk about memory address space like that. Uh, anyway, uh, the base pointer points exactly 16 bytes higher than the stack pointer, which means that my stack frame here is only uh, 16 bytes big, which is these two words. The string hello world is located here on the stack. And the instruction pointer points to this really high memory, I'm sorry, really low memory address, uh, which is actually this line of assembly right here. So whenever I hit the next arrow on my computer, uh, what's I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to be simulating 
the execution of my hello world program, and it's actually going to call uh, the, the main function of hello world, which is at this address here, OX400546. Uh, you may remember me saying earlier that the call assembly instruction has a side effect. Not only will the instruction pointer be set to the main function's address here, 546, but the address of the next instruction here, 59C, is going to get pushed to the stack. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So call main just happened. The, the address of the next instruction after calling main got pushed to the stack. The stack pointer address uh, got subtracted by 8 from C0 to B8. So now the stack pointer is here. And the instruction pointer got updated to main's uh, first instruction, which is this 55 byte that we remember uh, seeing earlier. So uh, whenever you're looking at uh, the disassembly of a program, every single instruction is really there just to get you closer to the, you know, whatever it is that the function is doing. In our case, we're trying to get down here to this puts, which is going to print hello world to the screen. The first three instructions are the uh, setting up of the function prolog, which uh, uh, basically is going to set up a brand new stack frame uh, on the stack, which is going to be right here in higher memory address space. So to actually set up a new stack frame, the first thing you do is you save the base pointer, the current base pointer here, DO, on the stack by pushing it. Okay, so it gets pushed to the stack. The push shifted the stack pointer back down uh, eight more bytes. And the next thing that we're going to do is shift this base pointer to be equal to the stack pointer, just like that. So now the stack is zero bytes in size. Finally, for main to actually have a scratch space to work with of 16 bytes, the stack pointer here, the top of the stack, is going to get another 16 bytes subtracted from it, just like that. So now the stack frame is in between these two memory addresses right here. Uh, and this is main's stack frame. Uh, for, let's see here. Uh, this version of my hello program actually does, uh, it actually does have an argument passed to it, which is the argument count. Um, think about this. Actually, no. This is the RDI RSI. So I'm actually going to pass the string pointer to hello world. And when I call, main, that function, that string pointer got passed in RDI. Sorry, this is on a second line here like this. It should be, it should be, RDI should be right here. And that string pointer to hello world, which is C0, is stored in RDI, is actually going to get pushed, I'm sorry, moved into the local stack frame of main, just like that. Um, so this memory address right now points to the hello world string, and it's part of main's stack frame, so that puts so eventually, this memory address gets passed back into puts by RDI and gets printed out to the screen. So that was just like a very short, small taste of how looking at the disassembly of a function works. You can watch the stack change through, through watching the stack pointer and the base pointer. And you can see which instruction is going to be executed next by looking at the instruction pointer and the disassembly. Uh, so I'm actually going to skip past these next couple of instructions just to show you the prologue of how leave works. So leave is one of these ones that's a bundled instruction that is going to actually restore the stack frame the way it was before main was called. And to do that, all that needs to happen is for uh, the base pointer to get moved into the stack pointer so that the, the top of the stack gets moved down. and then the value that's at that top, that new top of the stack is the old base pointer, which then gets popped into the base pointer register. And so it looks just like that. Okay? So that's like two, two for one instruction is leave. The last instruction of the function epilogue is ret. And all that ret is is a pop rip. And anytime you pop something off the stack, you just look at the stack pointer at this B8. And this was that instruction address that we saved right before we entered main and that's going to be put in rip which takes us right back to the instruction right after the call. Okay, so I know that was pretty intense. 
and maybe a lot. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Anything? Anything? Any comments, questions, concerns? Does it make sense to anybody? <laughs> what have I done? Okay. Uh, well, hopefully, um, let's see. The next part, uh, so this is only the first half. The second half is going to be the fun part where you all get to do this stuff and it's going to be like super clear, crystal clear. You're going to have fun and it's going to be like the best, most cool thing you've done all day. But before we do that, this part right here, endianness, is a terrible thing, but you need to know about it. Whenever I showed you earlier that hello string, hello world string in memory, uh, you couldn't really tell, but looking at a quad word like this, which is an entire eight bytes, uh, it would actually appear backwards. And in fact, this memory address right here that I'm circling with my mouse this byte, the C zeroth byte, is actually this byte on the far right. The C first byte is actually the 65 right next to it. So I'm actually counting right to left. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then 8, 9, A, B, C uh, to count in hexadecimal. And this is kind of a weird thing. Uh, if you want to know more about it, okay, so. I kind of neglected to mention this. Every single one of these slides has resources and web links and notes on the slide so you can read more about any of this. Okay, and this ending this one is no exception. This Wikipedia article will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about ending this. Suffice to say, when you are looking at these, oh geez, when you're looking in memory, uh, because of little ending this, when I look at this memory ad address here and see that the data stored at this memory address is this, this memory address looks right. I can read it left to right and see it looks like a memory address, uh, but strings will appear reversed. Uh, if I flip this and actually view it in byte order, so that the zeroth byte is here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that, strings will look right, but memory addresses will be backwards. So somehow, some way, one of the things is going to be backwards, and looking at the looking at the quad words in whole eight byte chunks like this, I feel like is the be better way to do it. Uh, but just keep in mind, strings will be backwards. Um, if while you're doing the radar session, you wanted to know more about this endianness, this slide at the bottom has some radar commands that you can use to actually see this in action. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so. This is the next part, which is super awesome and cool, uh, radar. So I think I probably want to get everyone to log into the NDG machines at this point. So the last couple things I want to talk about are just radar specific things. Um, whenever you whenever you run a program uh, and it accesses the standard input and output to get input from you and give stuff back to you in the form of text. Uh, that interferes with Red Air's own access to your terminal. And so there's a way to separate it out by using this thing called a raw run to profile, which is this bottom left file. I've actually already pre-made raw run to profiles for every single one of the challenges in here. And all you have to do to make use of them is execute these steps on the right, where uh, I'll actually demonstrate it. So if Ah, this. So uh, you can push Control Alt T to start up. Oh, geez. Um, just kidding. Push this little red screen-looking thing down here on the uh, taskbar next to the Start menu called Terminator. And this will start up the most badass terminal emulator ever, called Terminator. And uh, if your font size is too small, just hold Control and scroll up, and you can make the font bigger. And uh, last but not least, push, uh, if you push Control Shift E, you can split it hor uh, vertically like this. And if you push Control Shift O, you can split it horizontally like that. You can also do these splits by right clicking and just picking the option. But this gives you a nice terminal setup to work with. Also, if you can't see the mouse cursor, just come to Settings, click Mouse, 
click mouse cursor and say render remotely and then suddenly you can see the mouse and it's a lot better. So the, uh, okay I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, where am I? Uh, the instructions for setting up this raw round 2 profile are actually in in the box for, for every single one of the challenges. Just know that this screen illustrates how to do it. Uh, Radar has its own whole set of commands, which are listed on this slide. Uh, these are not all the commands at all. There are probably a thousand commands that Radar has. However, these ones that I've highlighted here in green are, uh, are really important ones to know. The takeaway from this slide really is to know that you can use a question mark after anything to get help with it, to show more commands and like the syntax on how to use something. When, when we're debugging things, all the debugging commands start with D for debug. So if I want to set a breakpoint, it's DB for debug breakpoint. If I want to continue execution after hitting a breakpoint, I type DC, which is debug continue. If I want to step, it's debug step. If I want to debug step over, it's debug step over, DSO, and so on. This one is also really important. Debug continue until return. Uh, this will save you if you get into crazy memory address space and you get back to your function. Okay? So, um, what else? When you're using Redair, uh, you can enter something called visual mode by typing a capital V and hitting enter. Visual mode is awesome. It's the best way to do debugging, but it takes over your keyboard. You can no longer enter regular Radar commands. The only way you can enter regular Radar commands is to type colon to enter command mode. Uh, when you're in command mode, all the other Radar commands will work, um, but visual mode is disabled temporarily. To exit command mode, simply t press enter. I've put all of this in all the documentation. Um, Last but not least, when you're reading the walkthroughs for every single one of these challenges, uh, any time that a command is intended to be entered in command mode, the command will be prefixed by a colon. Uh, any time that a command is intended to be entered in visual mode, there will be no colon. Uh, okay. Uh, this page right here also just lists the main visual mode shortcuts. And this slide breaks down visual mode for you. The, the little example that we had earlier of me disassembling uh, main in the little slideshow animation I made where I had the registers, the stack, and the disassembly. Well, Radar has the same thing, but a lot more of it. The top part that's green is actually a view of the stack. The important thing to take away from this is, see my mouse right here? It says B8. This B8 byte is actually this byte right here. It goes 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then C, 0 starts here, okay? So this word comes first from right to left, uh, 8 through F, and then C, 0 through C, 7, and then C, 8 starts on the next line, okay? Is that clear? To, does that make sense? It's backwards, sort of. Backwards, but you're counting up anyway? Okay. Well, if you have any questions about that, just let me know. Um, otherwise, the blue box shows you all the CPU, well, the most, the, the important CPU registers that you need for, for looking at assembly. These ones in the blue boxes here are your RBP base pointer, it's right here. RIP, right here, is RIP, that's your current instruction pointer. RSP is your current stack pointer. These are the ones that you look at a lot. And down at the bottom, you will see the disassembly of our print something function. And this is how you can see the instruction address space. Okay. Um, I'm actually planning to walk through the first binary hello with you, which is what this slide illustrates. Um, this is kind of a stupid slide. Don't really look at it. Uh, I'm going to leave this up on the screen though because it it lets you it, this this slide right here rescues you when you get into the badlands. Um, but before I put that one up on the screen permanently. I'll just demonstrate real quick. The way that I kind of intended for you all to consume this is to have a split terminal like what you see on my screen. Um, actually, let me just exit, exit. If I, okay. So you'll find this folder in your home directory called 2017 sit re presentation, okay? The, if you CD into this directory, 
uh, and type ls, you will see uh, these files. The PDF is literally a PDF version of the entire presentation I just ran through. Uh, the RE1 through RE4 folders each contain the little challenges I wrote. The README contains extra information, all the stuff that I'm saying right now. Okay, so if we CD into RE1, you'll notice that there are a bunch of files. Hello, this green one, is our binary. Hello.c is the source code for the binary. Hello.rr2 is the raw run 2 profile, which is not necessary for this and the next uh, exercise, but they're there anyway, just in case you want to use them. The walkthrough is the main thing that you want. Uh, so if after going into this folder, you go ahead and you split vertically, like so, uh, and go ahead and split this one horizontally, and this is kind of screen real estate, Green real estate is hard to come by. If you, okay, so if you manage to split this window vertically and you can actually use uh, less walkthrough like this and this file actually walks you through using Redair and debugging your first Hello program. Man, I wish these screens could get bigger. Uh, Oh, picked the wrong one. There we go. So, if you actually just open up this walkthrough file using less or cat or however you want to open it, it'll give you all the information um, you need to actually do this exercise. The other half of the exercise is in this file called questions. So, if I less questions, actually you can use nano since you can kind of fill in the questions. View nano questions. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Uh, nano questions. This will give you the questions file that lets you answer questions that I pose uh, throughout the walkthrough. So this top part is optional. I just talk about the raw run through profile. Um, these are some pre-instructions before actually running Red Air. So for instance, I tell you in this one, if you cat hello.c, you can see the source code. And if you see the source code before you start reversing it, you can actually get a little bit better of an idea of what's actually happening. Um, the walkthrough itself says, for instance, type r2-d dot slash hello. Uh, and this actually starts radar and loads hello as the program it's going to debug. Um, the next thing I have you do is type AAA to analyze the binary, and then switch to visual mode with capital V. Once you're in visual mode, this looks terrible, so you have to use PP to cycle through the different display modes until you get to the best mode, which is debug mode. Here you can see the stack on top, the registers in the middle, and the uh, disassembly of the instructions down here in the bottom. Um, all right, this, this command right here, you can see, is colon db. So that means to actually enter it, you have to type colon db main. This will set a breakpoint on the main function. And when I hit enter, the breakpoint will be set. Typing dc will allow me to continue to main. Sometimes it doesn't, and you have to hit continue again, which is really annoying. So. If you actually, if you don't get the output that says hit breakpoint, uh, you want to hit, you want to use DC to continue again, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, really, uh, continue execution until main. Uh, you press enter to leave command mode, and then I ask you your first question. So at this point, it's kind of like autopilot, y'all. If y'all have any questions. I really want you to work in groups because you can talk about it. Assembly. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you don't have to work in groups. If you want to work in groups, that's great because you all can talk about what's happening inside the program. It's great. It's great stuff. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Sweet. Yeah.